Then candidate Barack Obama started the trend in 2008, but Donald Trump perfected the use of social media in the 2016 campaign. And now the president elect uses Twitter daily to call out news organizations, or as we saw this week, talk about policies that relates to American companies. Washington Examiner reporter Susan Crabtree is here from the great city of Boston. Susan, nice to see you. Thanks for having me. Pretty interesting this morning. You know, typically you get to get these long statements coming out from the White House, and it takes time to craft them. Eight o'clock this morning, less than 12 hours after Fidel Castro's death. President-elect Trump tweets the following, Fidel Castro is dead, exclamation point, uh, which says a lot uh, in very, what is that, four words and one punctuation mark. That's exactly right. I mean, he has really harnessed this technology for to be able to speak directly with his supporters and circumvent the mainstream media. Uh, it's done very well for him. I don't see, I'm taking off my White House press corps hat here and uh, say, you know, I don't see any reason for him to stop doing this. Uh, every president since FDR with his fireside chats has used, harnessed the power of the current technology, JFK with television, to Ronald Reagan with television. You had President Barack Obama starting with the social media. Now we have Trump perfecting it and going around the media. Now, he, I don't really think he should be doing it at 3 a.m. anymore, you know, with a, talking about fights with the pageant winner that he's having. He needs to take it, you know, rein it in how, a bit how does, how does, and get how it under control and things? become a little presidential. How, how does this change things, though, Susan? The idea of the president of the United States sitting up in the residence at whatever time he feels like. I don't think anybody's going to take his phone away from him anymore and sending out whatever tweet he feels like this all of a sudden changes what's been a long-standing way. You go back to FDR's fireside chats. Those were looked at. Those were practiced. He crafted them. He had advisors. For this matter, Donald Trump at any moment picks up his phone, says whatever he wants. It could be something like Fidel Castro's dead, but it can also move markets. It can also have big effects on individual companies, as we saw when he tweeted about carrier air conditioning on Thanksgiving morning. That's right. I think it's going to be frustrating for his uh, communications team. I, I don't envy their uh, their role in this. And obviously, they tried to get him to rein it in in the days leading up to the the presidential election itself. Uh, you know, this can be it can backfire. But you've seen him do it in a very strategic way. It was a very effective for him the day the announcement of the lawsuit, the twenty five million dollars settlement in the Trump University lawsuit. You know, that news just radically changed when he started tweeting about. Uh, Vice Presidential uh, Pence at, at the Hamilton crew admonishing right. him during a performance well, or all, after the performance. All of a sudden, the social media just changed to that, and that was the news story all, of the all, day. All of a sudden, so you, all of a sudden, you can reclaim the news cycle. Uh, only have about 30 seconds left for you. Appreciate you being here. Put on your White House press corps hat once again that you took off earlier in this segment. How does this change things for the press who now has to cover not only whatever comes out of the White House briefing room, but the Twitter account that all of a sudden, to your point, changes things in a minute? Well, obviously, the White House press corps, uh, President Obama tried to do this by circumventing and going straight to the local media. And the local media asked very softball questions. President-elect uh, Trump is going directly to the people. Uh, he's circumventing all media entirely. Uh, I think that the White House press corps needs to continue to push for access, continue to push for real questions, real accountability, and they also need to, he needs to be uh, accommodating to their requests to be part of the pool. Yeah. This is a hi history. We do not need to have a Pravda, Trump Pravda, in this country. This is oh, essential Susan. to be for the fourth estate to have access to the president. Yeah. No, noteworthy, Susan. He hasn't had a press conference since being elected. Susan Crabtree in Boston. Check out Neptune Oyster while you're there. Thank you, ma'am. Turning now to the world stage, where some big challenges face the Trump administration right in its early days, including the deteriorating situation in Syria, Russia's growing influence in the Middle East, and the continuing threat from Islamic terrorism. Retired four-star Army General Jack Keane is the chair of the Institute for the Study of War and a Fox News military analyst. Uh, General, first of all, let's look at the big picture. What are, what are the main challenges that the new president faces? Listen, uh, the global security challenges that, that President-elect Trump is facing, we haven't seen the scale of these challenges, I don't believe, since the end of World War II with the rise of the Soviet Union. 
We've got radical Islam, ISIS certainly part of that, Al Qaeda part of that, morphing into a global jihad. No strategy, no global alliance to deal with it. We've got three revisionist powers, Russia, Iran, China, all seeking some form of regional domination and all having some success. Cyber espionage and cyber attack is exploding from our adversaries inside of our country and we're not, we don't seem capable of, of stopping it. What makes these challenges so serious, in my judgment, David, because we've had challenges before, is that we're failing so miserably at it and as hmm. a result of it, you know, our friends have lost faith in us, they don't trust us, they don't think we're reliable, and our adversaries are downright emboldened. And what we need is strong leadership here. All right. Well, you mentioned Islamic terrorism. That's a phrase that, that uh, President Obama wasn't even willing to say. At least now we have a president who's not afraid to say it. That's an improvement, isn't it? Oh, is it ever. We not only have to say it, we have to define it so the American people understand it. We have to explain it. We have to inform and educate so the American people are conversant with what this belief system is. They don't have to read any of the theology and philosophy behind it, but they, know how, they should know what the speech is, how people dress that are part of this, how people are acting, what their behavior is. So when they rise up in our communities, that there are friends and family members and co-workers that, are, that can identify it as such and do something about it. Now, the, the main focus of Islamic terrorism in the world is ISIS. And fighting ISIS, Donald Trump has said, is going to be his number one priority. How's the fight going? Are we winning or losing? Well, we're winning because we're taking territory back, and that's a good thing in Iraq principally. We do not have an effective plan to take the territory back in Syria. The president-elect will have to deal with that. But here's the, here's the other part of it. ISIS has expanded into 35 countries. We have no strategy and no alliances formed to deal with the reality of that. It doesn't mean that the United States has to be involved in all of that, but we certainly can help organize it and shape it, provide some resources, share intelligence. And we're not doing any of that. Now, Mosul is in Iraq. We're, we're going after them. It seems like kind of a tough slog. We're still fighting there. But what about, you mentioned Syria. Uh, the Russians, of course, are, are working with the Assad government, uh, which the United States says they want to get rid of, or at least President Obama did. Trump says he can work with Russia, with Russia to destroy ISIS. What do you think of that? Well, I think in dealing with Russia, we have to come at it in two ways. First of all, I think Putin took advantage of two presidents, President Bush and also President Obama, and had different levels of success with them. And certainly this president will be tested by Putin to be sure. This is a guy that is using aggression and force in Georgia, in Crimea, in eastern Ukraine, and now in Syria to achieve his geopolitical goals put Russia back on a world stage, and he's also very interested in Eastern Europe and particularly the Baltic. So he is on the move. He has to understand clearly that the United States is not going to tolerate this kind of aggressive and assertive behavior at, at the expense of our interests and the expense of our allies. And we have got to lay that market down clearly for him. Rebuilding the military is something that Putin will pay attention to because capabilities make a difference. And if we have the intent to use the military only when needed, then that also becomes then therefore a credible deterrent. I don't believe that has been the case with President Obama. I, I think Putin believes that no matter what escalation Putin would do, that this, this country would not respond. And I think he's been inside uh, President Obama's head for some time. So but, but, Trump has a huge opportunity here to yeah. reset this thing to our favor, to our national interests. But I'm just wondering, can, can we work with Russia in going after ISIS and against Russia with their expanding interests in Eastern Europe? I have lots of concerns at working uh, with Russia going against ISIS until we have agreements in terms of what Russia's behavior is going to be. I, I think what Putin wants certainly is us to work with him against ISIS. He's not in Syria because of ISIS. He's in Syria for one reason only, to prop up the Assad regime, which he's been able to do successfully. And now, every single day, his bombers are bombing innocent people on the battlefield along with the Syrian bombers to include his penetrating bombs have gone in and destroyed hospitals that are buried underneath the ground. He is committing war crimes. It's part of the overall mm. genocide campaign. 
We can't saddle up next to a guy like that and go after ISIS with him as a partner until his behavior changes. Interesting. General Keen, great to talk to you as always. Happy Thanksgiving, sir. Good to see you. Yeah. President-elect Trump easily won the Electoral College vote, but still thousands of liberals across the country don't want to accept him as our next commander-in-chief. They've been protesting, signing online petitions, threatening to move to Canada. You name it. So, I decided to head to Philadelphia to see what it is that people are so scared about. President Donald Trump, what do you think? I think it's stupid. I cried. I'm really disappointed, honestly. I'm scared. I'm really upset. He's a loose cannon. He's going to get us in trouble. I feel like I'm kind of in mourning for America. I'm really upset about this. Um, it really instills that there are a lot of um, homophobic, racist, uh, ignorant people in this country and um, very scary. Um, Do you want a hug? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We're trying our best. Don't cry for me. Argentina. I feel as though he just want to destroy the community. Did you vote? No, I didn't vote. I feel like President Donald Trump is going to doom the black race. I feel like him being a president is going to start a race war. Pray for Donald Trump. For those who don't like Donald Trump, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you and do good to those who hate you. Donald Trump was persecuted kind of like you. Yes. You guys have a lot in common. Yes. God bless the USA. God bless Donald Trump. He will be my president come January 20th, but he'll also be a president that I will plan to hold accountable to what he promised. Did you hold Obama accountable too? Well... How angry are you that Trump is going to be in the Oval Office? Um, I feel very angry about Donald Trump winning this election, and he should not be president. He's unfit to be president. I might move to Canada. You might move to Canada? Yeah. You sure Canada wants you? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't know. Are you considering moving to Canada now? Definitely not. I'm going to fight for a change here. We're going to mobilize here. We're going to take action here. But can you consider moving to Canada, please? I mean, Canada's a nice place. It's obvious that a lot of people are scared in America. You know who's really scared? Who's Hillary. That? Because Trump's going to lock her up. Bye, Felicia. How'd the left blow it so badly? Because Hillary's a terribly unlikable candidate. She is a corporate shill. She is, like, boring, unlikable, while someone like Bernie Sanders is, like, you know, electrifying and galvanizes voters. What do you think Hillary's going to do with all her free time? Uh, she can run for another political office. Probably not. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. What do you think Trump's going to do as president? He's going to think he has all the power in the world. And he's going to... He does. I think it's going to be a war soon, too. It's going to be a war. If there's a war, at least, when Trump's president, we'll win it. Sir, yes, sir. What is your biggest fear for a Trump presidency? Um, that he's going to mess up Social Security, Medicare, and... Aren't those programs already messed up? Yeah. I'm really sad that millions of people could be left without health care if he repeals the Affordable Care Act. Were you upset when Obama initially took away millions of people's health care? Uh, not particularly. Have you been medicating yourself? I've just been continuing to voice my opinion and not step down. A lot of people are, um, they are seeing, like, counselors in school and stuff, and mostly it's, yeah, all about attitude and not backing down. Do you guys want to go to your safe space right now? Like what? <laughs> I'm confused. <laughs> Do you know who I am? No, I don't. I'm Waters. Waters? And this is my world. Oh, cool.